We recently made some improvements to our IBC aquaponics system, and it's working beautifully. Hi, my name's Nick, and welcome to the Rig and Farm YouTube channel. I apologize if I look a little rough today. I just took down, moved, and set up 600 feet of goat and sheep fencing today, so I'm a little gross. We built this aquaponics system out of a 275 gallon IBC, some PVC pipe, tubing with valves, and a water pump. It cost us about $200 and only took a few hours to put it all together. I'll put a link to our build video in the video description below. As our blue tilapia were getting bigger, the amount of waste they produced was also increasing. We have a little pre-filter in our grow bed with some filter floss that catches some of that waste, but it was getting to the point where I was having to change it out a couple times a week. There's so much going on at the farm right now that I didn't want to have to spend any extra time dealing with that on an almost daily basis. That's why I decided to build this solid waste separator out of a 55 gallon plastic barrel. While I was at it, I went ahead and connected an additional 275 gallon IBC so the fish could have a little extra room to swim. The original setup gave us about 150 gallons of water for the fish, but with the ebb and flow of our grow bed up here, it was decreasing the amount by about 25 gallons at a time. So there was a constant fluctuation of the amount of water they actually had. Anyone who's ever had an aquarium knows that bigger is pretty much always better, so adding an additional 300 plus gallons of water to our system would make a much better environment for our fish. I will get to the one major downside of increasing the capacity in the system later in the video. The new and improved setup uses the original 150 gallon tank as a sump. A sump is a tank that you connect to your main aquarium that increases the amount of water you have and it's also where the majority of filtration takes place so you have more room in your aquarium for fish. The water pump has tubing with a T in it that carries water to the grow bed above and the fish tank, both controlled with valves to reduce the flow to an appropriate amount for each. It's kind of hard to see in here, but there's a bell siphon in this grow bed. The original setup used a 2 inch PVC piece for the siphon itself, and we upgraded that to a 3 inch piece, and the 3 inch gravel guard was upgraded to a 4 inch pipe. As water is pumped into the fish tank, the excess water is sucked through the bottom of this pipe, collecting solid waste, and it flows over to the solid separator. The PVC turns downward and into the barrel, where it then goes back up into this larger pipe. This causes the solids to sink to the bottom rather than floating around and being carried back over to the sump. All the excess water overflows back into the sump. Now let me show you how we built this, what mistakes to avoid, and how we had to compensate for those mistakes because I was being kind of cheap and decided to use less expensive parts. After moving the food grade 55 gallon plastic barrel and a new 275 gallon food grade IBC into place, I began by creating a hinged lid for the fish tank. To do that, I drilled a pilot hole in the top of the IBC. Then I used a jigsaw to cut the three sides of the lid. Cutting the plastic this way creates lots of little burrs, so they need to be cleaned up to create a clean edge. I like to use a utility knife. To make it easier to open, I used two eye bolts and a standard bolt to create a handle. I started by drilling the first hole and then measured where to start my second hole based on the length of the bolt. A couple of washers were used to hold the bolt in place without sliding through the eye bolts. Next, I used a hole saw to make a hole for the water outlet and a spade bit for the water inlet. The placement doesn't need to be exact, but you'll want the outlet hole to be a few inches from the top and the inlet hole at the highest point possible without being on top of the IBC. I used the utility knife again to clean up the hole. You'll need to measure from the middle of the hole to the bottom of the IBC and cut the standpipe to that length. After that was done, I used a water hose to wash off all the bits of plastic and drain them out of the IBC faucet. I used one inch PVC for the standpipe and water outlet. This is the do as I say and not the do as I do moment of the video. Use two inch PVC instead. I'll explain in just a little bit. Unlike me, use a two inch uniseal with two inch pipe. These uniseals create a watertight seal when you push the appropriate size pipe through them. 
Sometimes it's difficult to get the pipe in there, so you have to put a dab of cooking oil on the pipe and the seal to reduce the friction and get it inserted. The length of the outlet pipe doesn't need to be precise. Ideally, it'll be long enough to reach the center of the IBC and stick out towards your filter by just a few inches. Here's another mistake I made that I later corrected. I drilled a hole at the bottom of the standpipe and put a bolt through it as a way to keep it off the bottom of the IBC. This was stupid, and I'll show you what I did later to fix this problem in just a bit. I put a PVC T on the other end of the standpipe and connected it to the water outlet pipe inside the IBC. Next I joined two 45 degree connectors with a small piece of pipe and connected that to the outlet. Now to work on the solid waste filter before continuing with that. I used a 55 gallon barrel for the filter, but I had to cut off the top to make a lid. A drill was used to make a pilot hole before moving onto the jigsaw to finish the cut. When done, I flipped it upside down and trimmed off the burrs. Next, I had to mark a 4 inch circle for the vertical pipe to fit. Same drill and jigsaw procedure for this task. Then I had to drill some holes to put in some nuts and bolts to prevent the pipe from sliding all the way through the hole. Like a glove! I needed to drill three holes for uniseals and pipes. One at the bottom for the drain valve. You can definitely do a one inch hole and pipe for this one. The other two holes should definitely be two inches like the water outlet. One needs to be towards the bottom of the barrel to connect it to the outlet from the IBC, and the other one needs to be on the opposite side next to the sump just a few inches from the top of the barrel. Now get all three of your uniseals inserted. You'll use two more sets of 45 degree PVC connectors and a few straight pipes to make this configuration. The drain pipe needs a 90 degree connector on the inside of the barrel to suck up the solids that sink to the bottom. Use two 90 degree connectors with a straight pipe to allow the water to drain into the sump as the barrel gets filled. Install a ball valve to drain your water for water changes or cleaning out the barrel. Put the lid back on and put a PVC cap onto that 4 inch vertical pipe. Now that it's complete, ours was not complete, please use a 2 inch pipe instead of a 1 inch pipe like we did. It's time to run the tubing from the pump in the sump with the valve closed and fill up the new tank and barrel with clean water. Once the tank is full, turn the valve on for the water inlet and start cycling the sump water into the new addition of the system. You should let this run for at least a full day so that your fish can acclimate to the massive water change that just occurred. You want the water valve to be open almost all of the way to allow water to flow through the system as quickly as possible and allow for lots of surface disturbance that'll oxygenate the water. This was where I realized that the one inch pipe was not going to work very well. The water couldn't drain out of this new 275 gallon IBC fast enough, so it started to overflow and we were losing water onto the ground. I had to cut back the flow of the water so that it wouldn't overflow, but in the process we weren't getting enough surface agitation, therefore the oxygen levels in the water drastically dipped. I didn't fully realize the severity of this problem until after we moved our 40 blue tilapia into the new tank. We fished them out with a net and put them into the new tank, but within a few days, they started to die. We lost a total of 11 fish before we were able to make the changes necessary to bring adequate levels of oxygen into the water. So rather than scrapping the entire IBC and barrel, we made a few upgrades to allow for faster drainage when the inlet valve was open all the way. The first thing was using a one and a half inch standpipe with a PVC T that allowed us to keep the one inch outlet in place. I used a one and a half inch cap with several small holes drilled in it for the bottom of the pipe to suck up the solids without creating suction on the floor of the IBC. I had a leftover one inch uniseal from the multi-pack we bought, so I drilled another hole and stuck in another pipe with a 90 degree connector pointed upwards inside of the IBC. That pipe runs directly to the sump with another 90 degree connector pointed downward. Some of the solid waste that floats in the tank ends up in the sump because of this, but it isn't a huge deal. Speaking of solid waste, let me show you what it looks like when I drain the barrel. You can either empty straight from the valve into a bucket or stick a pipe or tube in it to direct it elsewhere. 
This nutrient-rich liquid fertilizer is great to water fruit trees or any other plant as long as you're not watering directly onto an edible fruit or vegetable. We use this runoff on our aquaponics tower as the sole source of fertilization. This system is working perfectly now that we've made those few modifications. Increasing the water volume like this definitely makes your water conditions more stable, but there is one downside to having an increased volume. Temperature control. We have two 1300 watt heaters to keep the tilapia warm enough to survive and thrive. They do best in 80 to 90 degree water, so we have one of the heaters set to 85 degrees and the other one to 84. Both heaters work to get our temperature where we want it, and one kicks off once it hits 85 degrees. When the water temperature drops below 75 degrees, the fish's metabolism slows down significantly and they don't really eat a whole lot. These blue tilapia can survive temperatures as low as 47 degrees, but you definitely don't want to get anywhere near that. Even when it's in the 20s or 30s in the early spring mornings, our water temperature still stays within the 70s. Within a few hours of the sun being up, we get right back where we need to. It's important that their metabolism stays up and they eat a lot because ultimately we do want to eat these fish someday. We're gonna let them grow out probably another month or two before we get our first harvest. At this point in time, their waste is actually more important to us because we need it for fertilizer. It was really sad that we lost more than a quarter of our fish because of my mistake. So hopefully you don't make the same mistake that I did and you can learn from me. Now let me show you how easy it is to grow a bunch of food in this system now that you have 450 degrees of nutrient rich water. The first thing we decided to grow this season was Swiss chard. It's very cold and heat tolerant, so it was perfect to start in the early spring when it still gets in the 20s and 30s most mornings. Growing chard from seed couldn't be easier in this system. I took a palmful of seeds and spread it around the 40 inch by 48 inch grow bed filled with expanded clay pebbles. Once they were distributed, I moved my hand along the surface to let the seeds drop down just a little. The only thing to do at this point was to feed the fish and let the system run. I'll show you how quickly this amazing green goes from tiny seed to harvest ready plant. It began to germinate six days after the seeds were sown. Now watch the progress over the next several weeks. We were ready for our first harvest less than seven weeks after putting the seeds into the grow bed. Chard is a biennial plant, meaning that it'll grow for two years before bolting and going to seed. Another name for this vegetable is perpetual spinach because it tastes similar to spinach and after cutting it for a harvest, it'll continue to grow and come back again, perpetually for the entire season. To harvest the chard, you wanna cut the stems just above the surface, making sure you're only getting the larger outer leaves while leaving the smaller center leaves intact. Ideally, you'll cut just one, maybe two leaves from each plant every few weeks. At the time of this recording, we've actually harvested five times in the last two weeks, and you can see that we still have a lot of chard in our grow bed. Swiss chard is one of our favorite vegetables in the entire world, and it's extremely nutritious and versatile in the kitchen. As I mentioned earlier, it tastes kind of like spinach, but it has a firmer texture that doesn't get quite so mushy when you cook it. Chard can be used in pretty much any recipe that calls for spinach. You can also eat it raw in salads or blend it up in a smoothie. It's also great to simply sauteed with a little salt and pepper and the optional, but totally mandatory, thinly sliced garlic. One cup of cooked chard has 35 calories, 3.3 grams of protein, and 3.7 grams of fiber. It's an excellent source of vitamin A, vitamin K, and calcium. It's also a good source of vitamin C and magnesium. It also contains several extremely healthy antioxidants. Really, an entire hour-long video could be dedicated just to the benefits of eating chard. In the next couple weeks, we're going to start transplanting most of this chard into our aquaponics tower that we have right next to it. That'll free up some room for us to start some beets, carrots, and radishes in this grow bed. 
Make sure you subscribe if you don't already to see how that goes and what it's going to be like when we harvest our tilapia for the first time. In summary, this relatively inexpensive system will give us fresh produce nine months out of the year, possibly longer if we put some frost cloth over it, and it'll keep our fish happy and fat, until we start plucking them out for dinner, of course. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time!